Hello, Plant Taxonomy students. Before we get going on today's lecture, I want to say that I am sorry that our in-person learning is paused right now, but I am still looking forward to being your instructor and for us to continue talking about plant taxonomy through dispersed uh, teaching methods. It's really important that we maintain our connection. And so to do that, I have written up here my email address, bmontgomery at uscupstate.edu. And I've also written up here my phone number, 864-503-5764. That is my office number. However, that number should still reach me because it forwards directly to my cell phone. So please get in touch if you have any questions and we can proceed with our learning. So let's begin today's lecture. We will be talking about early diverging eudicot families, as well as some rosid families. And to give you an overview of what this will include, we will start with early diverging eudicots. This includes the order Ranunculales. This is an order that we have already started talking about. Specifically, we've already talked about Ranunculaceae the buttercups. However, we have left to talk about Berberidaceae, the barberries, Papaveraceae, the poppies. After these groups, we will move into one of the large clades within the eudicots, and that is the rosid clade. And there are several orders within the rosids, and then many families within these orders. So the first order we'll talk about is Vitales, and that contains Vitaceae, the grape family. We'll also talk about Saxifragales, which contains Saxifragaceae, the saxifrages, and Rosales, which contains the Rosaceae family and the roses. Here's a phylogeny showing these groups. And what we can see here are all of the eudicots. So just to remind you where this is in the overall phylogeny, the eudicots are what occur after the split with the monocots. So this branch here, and of course it's not one species, it's a large clade, this would be the monocots. And even before that, remember, we had some angiosperm families. These were things like Magnoliaceae, Lauraceae, um, Calicanthaceae, and nymphaceae. So those were the early diverging dicots, but they weren't yet eudicots. So those were down here. Early diverging dicots. And then we have the monocots, and now everything above this line are the eudicots. And here are the ranunculales that we are going to start talking about. You can see that's a really early branch. After that, we are going to jump up into the saxifrages and some of the rosids. You can see rosid groups are all listed right here. So ranunculaceae, this is a quick review. These were the ones we talked about last week. They include uh, buttercups, and just some of the features that we emphasized were the fact that they tended to have many anthers. They have, or I should say many stamen rather. They also have many distinct carpels. So I apologize for getting cut off there. I was saying that we are still within the ranunculales order, but now the family is the Papaveraceae. So this is the poppy family. And this family is primarily either annuals or perennial herbs. So these are plants that are not woody, but they can live one year or more than one year. They tend to have secretory cells. The fancy term for this is lactisif lactisifers, but I'm happy with secretory cells, whichever you prefer. They have alternate leaves, which is true of most things we've talked about so far. The leaves tend to be lobed or divided 
or dissected. And I will show you that on the uh, subsequent slide. And I'm going to tell you now, and we'll talk about this more in a couple minutes, but the Papaveraceae family now includes a second group that used to be its own family. These are the Fumariaceae. And so when you are keying out plants in Radford, Ollies, and Bell, you will need to be able to recognize which ones belong in the Papaveraceae family according to Radford, Ollies, and Bell, and which ones would key out in the Fumariaceae according to Radford, Ollies, and Bell. But if you're asked what family any of these are in, you'll just tell us that they're in Papaveraceae because that is the contemporary classification. And here's an example of a poppy. This is the California poppy, which is obviously uh, common on the West Coast. So we said that poppies tend to produce sap. It's produced by secretory cells, and the sap may be either white or sometimes clear or colored. The sap typically contains alkaloids, and alkaloids are nitrogenous compounds that tend to be alkaline or basic in pH. And these compounds, there are a wide range of them, but some of the ones we're more familiar with include morphine, codeine, and heroin. Um, nicotine is also an alkaloid. So because of these alkaloids and poppies, most poppies are poisonous. There are some exceptions. I have read that California poppy is not toxic, although I have not tested that, and I do not encourage you to try consuming it. We said already that Papaveraceae leaves tend to be dissected or even We said that Papaveraceae leaves tend to be lobed, dissected, or compound. You can see an example here of a dissected leaf with breaks going almost to the mid vein. You can see in this middle picture lobes, and you can see in this right hand picture an example of a leaf that is actually compound. Another defining characteristic of the Papaveraceae, or the poppies, are that they have connate carpels forming a single pistil. And so this has been unusual so far. I think the only example we've seen of this thus far is Nymphaceae, the water lilies. Um, but here we'll see it for our second time. And so you can see, for example, in this left-hand photograph, There are not multiple distinct carpels, but you can see from these lines that are the stigmas that there are in fact multiple carpels that have fused together to make a single pistol. And in this picture, it's a little bit harder to see, but you can see again where I'm circling with the pen in the middle, there is a single pistol and you can see that there are multiple stigmas coming off of it. And so that must mean that it's one pistil comprised of multiple carpels. The fruit in Papaveraceae is a capsule. So remember that means it is a fruit that is dry, it is dehiscent, it opens, and it is comprised of multiple carpels. And so a classic poppy pistil is shown up here at the top of the slide. Oops. We need to talk a little bit about the Fumari AC. Remember I said that this used to be considered a separate family. It is now considered to be part of the poppy family. If you look in Radford, Ollie's and Bell, then anything that has the shape of flowers we'll talk about now will key out in the Fumari AC family. So again, if you see a flower like this one, for example, on an exam, you will answer that it is in the Papaveraceae, but then when you start to key it, 
you will open your guide to the Fermari AC. Characteristics of this group include the following. First, they have bilaterally symmetric flowers. You can see that here. It is symmetric left to right, but it is not symmetric um, like rays of a wheel. And you can see that up here as well. These are two of the most famous examples of Fumari AC. The bottom one is Dutchman's breeches. You can see they kind of look like, I don't know, upside down pants. And up here you can see Bleeding Heart. And I think it's pretty clear why Bleeding Heart gets this name. And so these are both common plants grown in gardens. Um, we also have Dutchman's breeches as a native species in our area. So again, bilaterally symmetric flowers. These have sap, but the sap is watery. It is not milky and colored as it is in the Papaveraceae, the, the plants that Radford, Ollies, and Bell would consider to be Papaveraceae. Here are the general characteristics of the family. Of course, this is a eudicot family. These are usually herbs uh, for our purposes. The leaves we talked about being lobed, divided, or sometimes compound. The flowers are hermaphroditic or bisexual. We talked about the two different symmetries depending on which subfamily we are focused on. The sepals are either two or three in number. So two is an unusual number, and that's gonna be a helpful clue. Three also is unusual outside of the monocots. So that's another pretty good clue about this family. The petals, or the, rather the sepals are distinct and they are deciduous, meaning that they fall off. So if you're looking at one of these on an exam and you see some flowers that are lacking sepals, that should be a clue to at least think about Papaveraceae. The petals are in two whorls, so there are two sets rather than simply a spiral. This is unusual. I don't think we've seen whorls yet. And for the petals, there are either two whorls, each with two petals. So in other words, there will be a total of four petals, but it will be clear that two of them are paired and two others are paired. Or there may be two whorls of three. So in other words, a total of six petals but they're clearly in two sets of three each. There's also some exceptions to this where there are many petals and they're not clearly in whorls. The petals are distinct, which is what we commonly see. There are numerous anthers. This is the same as ranunculaceae and most other things that we've talked about so far. The pistil is superior. Again, that's the normal for what we've seen so far. We said that this time it is composed of at least two carpels that are united together, or syncarpalous. And we said that the fruit is a capsule and there's milky latex. I'm gonna show you some pictures of ones that we have in the area. This top one is bloodroot, and I'll show you in a second why it's called that. You can see its petals don't follow the common uh, numbering scheme for this. Instead, there are just many petals for uh, bloodroot. You can see that lobe leaf as well, leaf as well. And then down below, this is um, Dutchman's breeches, I believe. And so um, a plant that we can find out in the wild. I was just showing you bloodroot on the previous slide. Here I'm going to show you why bloodroot gets its name. What you can see here is a cross section of the root of bloodroot, and obviously it is bright red um, and hence resembles blood. And here's what the root looks like before it's cut up. It still has that bright red color. And so that color comes from the milky sap that we were discussing. So we have discussed two families in the order Ranunculales, Ranunculaceae and Papaveraceae. We will now move on and talk about the final family that we'll discuss in this group, that is the Barberries, 
or Berbera Desi. Notice that it's an E in the first syllable here rather than an A, even though the common name is Barberry. Uh, students often mess that up on exams. So Berbera Desi are herbs or shrubs. We have both. Again, they are alternate leaf arrangement, which is, I think, the only thing we've seen so far. The flowers are typically three maris. In other words, parts comes in multiples of three, like three or six or nine. And so this was one of the possibilities in Papa Veresi, but this is another group that has it. And the characteristic to look for in this group is having smooshed, that's not a formal word, bulbous is the more formal word for the shape of the stigma. So stigmas that look kind of like a light bulb. Let's start with the leaves. Leaves can be simple, dissected, or compound. So here, this is from a actual barberry shrub. You can see that the leaf is pretty generic and simple in shape. You can also see that leaves can be compound. This plant is called twin leaf, and it gets that name because it literally has two leaflets that make up each leaf. So there's the left leaflet here, and then the right leaflet over here. But these aren't separate leaves. They are, in fact, leaflets, and you would see one pedial beneath. They also can be even more compound. So a shrub commonly planted around campus and that now escapes into the woods is called Nandina. Um, and you can see what we're looking at here is one single leaf. And that leaf is twice compound. So it divides into these leaflets that then further divide into sub leaflets. I will show you um, a few examples just so you have a sense of the family. You are not uh, responsible for memorizing anything about this plant, but this is a species that grows in the Eastern United States called blue cohosh. And you can see some of the family characteristics. For example, you can see perianth in multiples of three. We have one, two, three, four, five, and six petals. You can also see, uh, perhaps a little bit at least, the uh, bulbous stigma. It kind of are these spheres right in the middle. We'll look at that up close um, in just a minute. And you can see the lobed leaf shape. Here is another example of Berberidaceae. This is the genus that gives the species its name. Note the simple leaves and the berries and the very squashed stigma, the bulbous stigma sitting right on top of the ovary right here. If you could count flower parts, you would see that these petals were in multiples of three. The next examples I'll show you from this family are mayapple. This is a woodland herb. It grows in forests and big patches around here. And you can see that its petals are in multiples of three. You can also again see this bulbous stigma sitting on top of the ovary. And I showed you Nandina leaves earlier. Here I'll show you a Nandina flower and you can see again, it's less bulbous, but the stigma is nonetheless bulbous and again sitting right on top of the ovary. And again, notice that the anthers are in multiples of three. So to summarize this group, they are herbs or shrubs, alternate, perfect flowers that are actinomorphic. The perianth, this gets a little bit complicated, but there tend to be multiple petal and multiple sepal whorls. So it has both, but then within each, there are usually two whorls, and each whorl has three parts or sometimes two parts.
So a common arrangement would be to have six sepals, the sepals in two whorls of three each, plus six petals, again in two whorls of three each. We noticed this a few times. There are six stamen. They happen to have valvular dehiscence, but you probably won't need that trait to identify the family. The gynoecium is superior. We saw that in several pictures. There's one carpal, and I've mentioned the short bulbous stigma several times. Of course, in the family named something berry, the fruit, not surprisingly, is in fact a berry. We will now move on to the saxifrages. They are in this group right here, whose origin is a little bit unclear, but they are either part of the rosids or they are almost part of the rosids. You can see that that line gets really close. Within saxifragales, we will talk about only the saxifragaceae or the saxifrage family. You do not need to memorize numbers, but it's a medium-sized family with 35 genera and about six to 700 species. These are mostly herbs for our purposes, but there can also be vines or shrubs. And the feature that we will look for when we think a plant might be a saxifrage is this unusual pistil. The pistil is composed of a basally united carpal and diverging apices to that carpal. So it's almost like the carpal splits apart about halfway up. And then there will be two styles and two stigmas. And if you draw a little face on it, then it can look like a friendly snail or slug. The leaves are alternate, usually. Um, there can be exceptions. Um, on flowering stems. They can also be basal. What that means is that all of the leaves come out right at ground level and you can't really tell whether they are alternate or opposite or world. The leaves can uh, have teeth but they are basically simple. Flowers are hermaphroditic and what else do we need to look at here? We've said that they are herbs and shrubs, alternate leaves, perfect flowers. The flowers are actinomorphic. I'm going to change this detail. The sepals are distinct at the top, but just like the pistil is basally united and divided at the top, this tends to be what we see for the sepals. So if you look at the bottom of the flower, those sepals are all connected into almost a cup. But if you look a little bit higher up on them, then they diverge into clearly separate sepals. So we can call that basally united. And there's four there. I guess I should be drawing five in a circle. The petals do the same thing. They are basally connected to each other, but they are separate at the top. I won't try to draw that again because it didn't go great the first time. You can just think of this as being five lobed for both of them, and that gives you the idea. The androecium, so the number of stamen, is either just five or it is two whorls of five, which we can call five plus five. So everything here is some multiple of five, right? And this is going to be really common for the rosids. It's not a perfect rule, but most things in the rosids are multiples of five. One way of remembering this is that rosid has five letters. The gynoecium is an exception. It usually has two carpals, as we've been saying. Four is in parentheses here because there's some exceptions. We talked about the, them being basally united and separate at the top. Um, so that lobing is a really distinctive trait that's probably the trait I use most to the, identify this family. These can be superior, so the ovary or the carpal is sitting on top of the other flower parts, but they may be inferior with the other flower parts instead on top. And so when we see inferior, 
That's unusual. We haven't seen it very much yet. The fruit, don't worry that it's septicidal, but you do need to know that the fruit is a capsule. I'm going to show you some examples you are not responsible for memorizing, but it will help you recognize them on quizzes and exams. So this is Huchura Americana, and you can see it's an herb. You can see that the leaves are basal. They're all coming out of the ground at the same place. You can also see really clearly here those united sepals. So right here, the sepals are all together, but then we have five sepal lobes up at the top. You should be able to see that for the petals too. And it looks like this species is one that has five stamen. I don't have that memorized, but if I'm counting correctly, then that, that's right. You can see that the leaves um, are maybe crenate, but they aren't deep enough to be considered lobed. This leaf shape is really common in Saxifragaceae, so it's hard to exactly describe it, but if you get used to seeing it, it's a pretty good clue about the family. We will move on now to our next family, which is Vitaceae, or the grape family. So the next family that we'll talk about are Vitaceae. The next family that we'll discuss are Vitaceae, or the grapes. And grapes are climbing woody vines. You've probably seen this um, either in the woods or on vineyards. They are pollinated by small insects and they have small flowers. The fruits, of course, are berries, and if you don't know that, then you have to try to find some grapes that have seeds, and you should be able to pretty easily tell that there are multiple seeds inside, and of course, it's a fleshy fruit. Let's go over characteristics, then we'll talk a bit more about them. So where we live, these are all climbing vines. And importantly, all of our grapes have tendrils. Remember, tendrils are support structures that twine around branches. The tendrils are always opposite leaves. Let me draw what that looks like. If this is our stem, we might have a leaf come off, like so. And then right here would be a tendril. And then in most cases, the next leaf is going to come off on the other side of the stem and the tendril will be across, and then that pattern would repeat. And those are the characteristics that we will rely on to recognize this family. That plus the fruit being a berry. I've told you other characteristics of their flowers here, and they do have kind of cool flowers. If you look up close at them, you do not need to memorize those because for our purposes, the vegetative traits are enough to recognize this family. I will show you some examples um, just to help you recognize them. You will actually learn some of these species when you use the VLPI software. Even though they're not trees, we are including them with some of your other woody plants. And so this example is Parthenocissus or Virginia creeper and it is a very common vine. It often grows in yards and is sort of weedy and hard to control. It's got these blue berries. Um, they are smaller than grapes but have a similar shape. Here are some up close um, images of the flowers and you can see that the leaves are comprised of five leaflets shown like so. And so it's, uh, I bet if you go out into your yards or walk around campus, you will see a lot of this plant. The next uh, group that we'll look at with Invitaceae is Vitus. These are the grapes, and this is the group that gives um, the family its name. And I'm showing you details of the flower here, but I will not hold you responsible for those. I will ask you to look at a cross section of an ov ovary. You can see that there are four ovules inside. And so this is why a grape would have up to four seeds, but not more. 
And with VLPI software, you will learn to identify um, two species of grape. There are more in the region, but we're teaching you two common ones whose leaf shapes are easily recognized. You can see that there's a lot of variation in leaf shape, even within the species and even within an individual. Part of this variation relates to whether they grow in sun or shade. So the grape genus is of course what gives us the fruits that we eat and the fruits that we use to make wine. The next group that we'll talk about are Ampelopsis or pepper vines. These are somewhat less common than the last two, but they're also pretty common and I can find this growing in my yard. You can see that the leaves are compound. So, you can see that the leaves are bipinnately compound. This is all one leaf. It is split into leaflets, which are then further split into subleaflets. And you can see that the fruit is, again, a grape-like berry. We are now going to move on to a large and important family. This is by far the most important family that we have discussed thus far. Just to give you a sense, most of the families we've talked about might be one up to maybe five pages in our textbook. Our textbook is Radford, Ollies, and Bell. And so we're just going to call it RAB, or our field identification book, I should say, not the textbook. So if most families are between one and five pages, the Rose family is 38 pages. Um, and it includes a variety of growth forms, herbs, shrubs, and trees. It is far more diverse than the things that you would recognize as roses. So those are in the group, but there's also a lot more. And I'm showing you a couple of pictures um, of a shrub or a small tree that's a rose and also a uh, trailing vine that is a rose. So here are some examples of that diversity. We have some common fruits and edible plants, uh, raspberries, strawberries, and blackberries. And these all have, what's the right word? They are aggregate fruits. We have apples and pears. And then we also have the stone fruits. Cherries, plums, apricots, and almonds are all in this family. The leaves can be pretty variable within this group. They range from being simple so like this cherry leaf shown on the left, it's got some teeth, but no lobes, to being palmately compound. So this probably blackberry has five leaflets per leaf arranged like the palm of your hand, or they can be pinnately compound. So arranged like a feather. And I know you had these terms earlier in the semester, so it's just a review. The leaves are often stipulate. Let me, if I can make a pun, let me stipulate what stipulate means. Stipules, you probably recall from the beginning of the year, one of your second lab, I think, are little leaf-like appendages at the very base of a leaf blade. They can be different shapes. So if this is our leaf up here, and here is our branch, then it's these little leaflets that attach on both sides of the pedial, right where that pedial hits the branch. And sometimes these look more like leaves, sometimes they look more like little flaps. And in roses, we will often see that they are adnate to the pedial. I will draw that up close. So what that means is they are attached along one side directly to the pedial. They kind of look like extensions of it. In many cases, they are toothed, so something like so. 
An important characteristic that is universally true in the rose family is that there is a hypanthium present. So a hypanthium is a cup-like structure shown right here in which the ovary sits. So here's our ovary and the hypanthium is really an extension of the receptacle. It's not sepal, it's not petal, and it's not anthers. It is the tissue to which those things attach. But it forms a cup with the ovary sitting therein. And then attached to the top of it, we have, of course, the stamen, the petals, and the sepals. And so this is the situation where we have a flower that is perigynous, peri meaning around. So you can see that the flower parts are not sitting on top of the ovary, they're not sitting below the ovary, but they're sitting on this disc that encircles the ovary. So when there's a hypanthium, this is review, we're gonna call this perigynous. And so you can see it in that first picture, here, we again have a hypanthium present. It's a cup-like structure shaped like this. And down here, we again have a hypanthium present. This looks like an inferior ovary, and I think that that would be fair to call it so in this case. But even though the ovary is inferior, there's still this cup-like extension of the receptacle. And so we can say it's both inferior and in this case, that there's a hypanthium present. In this case, we would say it is superior, but there is a hypanthium present because the ovary is not completely surrounded by receptacle tissue. Some other characteristic. We said that in the rosids, five was a common number, and this is a good example of that. The perianth is five maris. There are variations, but typical numbers are five sepals and five petals. Anthers, there are typically many of them, so there can be somewhere between 20 and infinite. They are distinct. In this respect, they can sometimes look like a, I don't know, a buttercup flower, for example. The gynoecium is variable. There can be only one carpal, or there can be many of them. They can be syncarpus, or they can be apocarpus. So united or distinct. And as we saw on the previous photos, they can be superior or inferior. And the fruit type is variable. So really what we're getting here is that there is a lot of variation. On the one hand, that can make them hard to recognize, but we have a couple things to go on. We have, remember, those stipules often being present. So things to look for. Stipules. And number two, that universal trait of a hypanthium however the other flower parts occur. Let's look at our summary of key characteristic. Variable habits, excuse me. Variable leaves, but those adnate stipules are often there. Flowers are perfect, inflorescence is variable, flowers are actinomorphic, Hypanthium, hypanthium, hypanthium. I hope you're tired of hearing me say hypanthium. Uh, perianth in multiples of five. Pay attention to this because we will see it a couple of times. There are often five sepals, but they alternate with bracts. A bract is any leaf-like appendage that's not acting like a leaf. So when we have weird flower parts, we often refer to them as bracts. 
And so what will this look like? If you're looking at the flower, you might see those five sepals, one, two, three, four, five, but then there are appendages between them that connect them together like so. So if you're not careful, when you count these, you're going to think that there are 10 sepals. But if you look closely, you'll see that these smaller ones are coming from a different location. And so that's why we're calling them bracts. And this five bracts plus five sepal arrangement is pretty common. We said many stamen, that's a characteristic to focus on, and variable gynoecium. I will show you some examples so you get a sense of the diversity in this family. Um, Podentella is a pretty common genus. They can be herbaceous or shrubby, and you don't need to memorize this. This is just as an example. They have compound leaves. This is not pot. This is a native plant. It's not even a pot relative. You can see the five petals here. You can see 20 or many anthers, and you can almost make out the fact that there are many distinct carpels here and an arrangement that looks a lot like a buttercup. So if I saw this flower, I would initially think it was a buttercup. Many anthers, many distinct carpels, those both are in line with buttercup. The way that you would tell it's not are by dissecting a flower and seeing that there's a hypanthium and then also focus on this trait. So what are we seeing down here? And you're probably tired of me saying it, but these are the adnate stipules at the base of the pedial. Let's see if I can color that in. And so that would tell you definitively that yes, this is a rose, not a ranunculaceae. I will show you just a couple more examples. Since we're in the Carolinas, I need to show you Rosa Carolina. This is the Carolina rose. And this is a common species in open pastures as well as open woods. So in other words, forest that isn't too dense. You can see those many anthers um, that is characteristic. And that hypanthium develops into the fruit on a something in the rose genus. So remember the hypanthium is like this, and you can see that has given rise to this fruit that still has, I think, the uh, sepals attached right here. And rose hips are collected and used, for example, to make tea. I will show you one last species. This is a shrub or small tree. Um, it is red chokeberry, and that tells you something about how good its fruits taste. But actually, they are edible and fairly good if you add enough sugar. Um, and this forms spreading colonies um, in, uh, in areas that are relatively open. So again, you can see many anthers and you can see that there are five petals per flower and the fruit looks somewhat similar to that rose fruit we were just looking at. I think that this is actually fleshier while rose fruit um, eventually dries. So that is the end of today's lecture. Uh, going forward, I will intend to embed uh, questions in the lecture to make sure that you're keeping up and practicing what you're learning. But for today, because I'm posting this late, I am going to leave this lecture without any embedded questions. Please let me know by email or by a phone call if you have any questions about the material we've talked about, and I will look forward to resuming our conversation. I will have our Thursday lecture up in, uh, at an earlier time.